All right. Good morning, everyone, or evening, or whatever part of the world you're from. My name is Brian Anderson. I am an instructor with Africa Fire Mission um, and also your host for today's training. I've been with Africa Fire Mission since 2019. Um, then went to Kenya and done. I have done several of these virtual trainings. So it's good to see everyone coming online. Um, today we have Jeff Jacobs. Um, he is from California and he will be our instructor. But first I'll start with a few words of encouragement. Um, I just, life of service is very important to me. And I think that's true for most firefighters in general. Um, you'll always see firefighters doing other things outside of firefighting to impact their families and their communities. Um, like my, myself, I volunteer at veteran organizations, uh, volunteer at church, um, and several other organizations. And that's what we're called to do in the Bible, right? You know, we're, we're, we're called to help others and to serve others. You know, even Jesus would wash feet of other people. So as we go through our lives, just remember that a life of service is, is important and it's really ingrained to, into who we are as firefighters. Um, so I guess without further ado, I'll hand it over to Jeff. Thank you, Jeff, for uh, volunteering to do this today. I'll let you take over. Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Uh, good evening, I think, for you guys. Um, my name is Jeff. It's good morning for me. It's it's 5 a.m. here uh, in California. So uh, I just want to start off saying thank you so much for, for being here. You know, I'm, I'm truly honored that that you guys would spend uh, your time and your money to come listen to listen to me say random things um, in the hopes that that it makes you better. So um, I'm just really honored that you guys guys are here and, and thank you so much. So um, a little bit about me. Um, I'm a full time fire captain in California um, in the Bay Area, kind of near San Francisco in a small valley called Silicon Valley. So uh, I've been a captain for about five years. I've been in the fire service for 15 um, during that time, been a paramedic. Uh, I've been on a, a type one hazmat team. Um, on the teaching side, um, I volunteered and went to Kenya with AFM in 2020. Let's see if we're 2024 now, 2021. Um, and this is my my third kind of webinar with with AFM, and it's been great. I've met some really awesome people. Um, just what what an amazing organization to have these online resources and the, the blog posts <clears throat> and the multiple missions, you know, it's, um, it's really an amazing, amazing opportunity to, to serve. Um, on the instructor side of my, my background, um, I, I don't want, I hate talking about myself. Um, I, I am a primary instructor in multiple, uh, in two different types of academies. Um, I'm a California master instructor. So I teach other instructors, um, how to get up here and talk on forever. Um, <clears throat> before this, I was in, in the army, I was a flight medic, um, and I was an instructor in the army as well for mostly medical things and how to, uh, fly in helicopters, which was, um, a lot of fun when you're young. So, all right, let's move on. I'm going to attempt to share my screen. I feel like I did it. Are you guys able to see my screen? Yes, we can, Jeff. Awesome. Awesome. All right. So today's topic, fire suppression. What a huge uh, topic. There's so much to it. My goals for today is to give you guys a little bit of background information and some good street tips, tricks, little nuggets to make your, your lives a little bit easier, right? You'll, you guys will have to be making those decisions in the streets, right? 
And, and we all know a, a real incident, it's moving quick. There's a lot of dynamic situations going on, a lot of inputs, and we, we have to do something. So my goal for at the end that you leave with something that when, when things are getting cloudy, that, that fog is setting in, I go, I'm going to go do this. Because I know with my background information and a couple tips and tricks, I can still be successful. So there we go. So kind of the outline of our uh, of our course here, we're going over some goals of fire suppression, why we're doing it, which is kind of important to start with that, right? If we don't know why we're doing something, then the rest of the process is just as mysterious of why we're doing it in the first place. Going over some backgrounds, some fire science and fire dynamics. Those are two, two different things. We're going to go into a little bit of, of each. Um, we're not going to go super deep into stuff. We're not going to start talking about, you know, um, carbohydrate change and oxygenization. We're just going to go over some basic stuff that actually pertain to what we do at, with our job. We're going to go over some strategic objectives, um, some tactical objectives, and then getting into that, that meat of the thing. It's tasked to be successful. Some actual takeaways of what can I do in the streets? So um, I'm not a fan of listening to lectures or going to classes where they talk about theories and background information and science, but they never tell you, here's what I need you to go do, right? And so that's that's something big when, when I teach. I like to give you guys something. Let's see here. Uh, we'll go into to some water supply. Um, and the water supply is going to be more of an open um, an open discussion. Fire suppression is really hard when you don't have water. You really need water. So I want to hear from you guys of where your organizations, your departments, where you guys at. How's the water supply? How's our equipment? How is our PPE? And how are we really going to do things? Because um, there's certain tasks and tactics that we can do if we don't have good water supply, good equipment, good PPE, and there's tactics we can do if we have better equipment and water supply and PPE. And we're, we'll, we can go over both, but I'm gonna need feedback from you guys of, of kind of the, the situation you guys are in. Um, again, equipment, staffing difficulties, those are gonna be um, open discussions. So, and then at the end, we'll, we'll go over some questions. All right. <clears throat> okay. Goals of, of fire suppression, right? And they, they mimic the goals of the fire service, right? Life, incident stabilization, property conservation, and environment cons conservation, right? Um, there's a great saying out there. A property place handline can save more victims than a single rescue crew in any fire. I, I think that's bold. I think you need both. I think you need a rescue crew and a, a ho property um, place hose line. But fire suppression takes away the problem. If we have a fire with multiple victims, if we put out the fire and let the smoke out, then we just have a giant game of hide and go seek. So if we can get rid of the problem, we can make the search and rescue a lot easier, right? Everything that we do in the fire service on an emergency emergency scene that's hard to say goes back to life life safety instant stabilization property environment so if we can get rid of the problem then we don't have the impact for all of those um a big a big thing that we see a lot um when we're talking about hose line placement and fire suppression is the protection of egress routes um an egress route is like how we're getting out of the building. For the most part, the majority of victims can walk out of an emergency, right? With some exceptions, like people are sleeping, people who have handicaps, things like that. So if we can protect egress routes, we can accommodate people's ability to self-rescue. And when I say that, I'm thinking of a fire. We uh, There was a fire in Los Angeles. Um, in California, one of our bigger properties is called a garden style apartment, which you guys probably don't have there, but it's just a two or three story apartment with the stairs on the outside of the building. Um, they access their apartments from the outside of the building. It's only, it's not very tall. It's only two or three stories. There was a fire in a first story apartment 
And as the fire was coming out of the window, it was engulfing the stairway for people to come down. And so there was two stories of people trapped because the fire was over the stairway. That's a great first line placement, right? We can get in there, we can get a line down, we can knock that fire out from the outside, protect that stairwell so people can self self rescue. Um, talking about life safety more and, and, and instant stabilization, one thing that we teach big in, in our academy is that first line, if there's no other stimulus to drag us someplace, you know, like that, I was talking about that fire coming out over the stairwell. We have no stimulus dragging us someplace else. That first hand line needs to go between the fire and the victims, right? We need to set up that defensible space between the fire and the victim so that rescue crews can come in behind that hose line and take out people, right? We can make conditions better for people to leave and we can make conditions better and safer for rescue crews to come in there and start um, evacuating people. And that's with or without an SCBA, right? We have to make that decision where, where that risk is, but we can put streams in through a window. We can lay low and put, put water down range 30, 40 feet, right? So, um, yeah, let's get that hose line in place. It's the stabilization. Again, we just don't want this fire taking over the, the entire block. Let's try to confine it to either the room, the building. Um, you know, we don't want this thing getting bigger. Property, same way. Um, I, I have a, a very strong um, emotional opinion about property conservation. Like, this is their stuff. This is all they got. Like we, we need to, um, you know, fulfill our oath in protecting life and property. I don't think we should risk our lives to save property, but, you know, this is all they got. We, we should be saving their stuff. So in the environment, of course. All right, let's go over some, um, some background stuff. Fire science, fire dynamics. Two different things, right? Fire science is, you know, that triangle. Fuel, oxygen, heat into a chemical oxi oxidization. Ooh, that was a hard word. Oxidization um, reaction over to our um, our products, our smoke, heat, fire, pressure, all that stuff. That's the science stuff, right? It's chemistry, some physics stuff. Fire dynamics, a little bit different now, right? Dynamics, in my opinion, a little bit more important to us than the fire science, right? Fire dy dynamics is how is that fire behaving? in that house, inside that structure? And how's it behaving when we show up and start doing our stuff, right? A lot of pressures, um, pressures, temperature, gases expanding and contracting, <clears throat> um, creating flow paths, stopping flow paths, it moving, hidden compartments, all that kind of um, hot, hot topic stuff. So, um, sorry, let's see if I can go back. One thing with dynamics, so kind of why I think um, dynamics are important. When I was going through uh, my academy, my um, for my my current department, San Francisco, who which is a real big city, it's not not too far away from where I work. It's maybe thirty minutes away from where I work. They had a um, two line of duty deaths. Um, they show up. First engine shows up. House is on fire. It looks like a two story house from the street. They go pff, easy. We've done this hundreds of times before, we'll do it again. They take a hose line inside and they find a stairwell, but the stairs going down, it's not going up. And they go, huh, well, the heat's coming from down, so we're gonna go down. Well, the structure turned out to be on a hillside. So what they saw from the street was just what was on top of the hill. And there's three stories below the street. They went down, started fighting the fire and um, someone, um, went to investigate someone that's not on their crew went to investigate they walked down the hill they found the fire at the bottom and they broke the uh, the sliding glass door because of dynamics that turned their stairway that they were going down turned it into a chimney because of how pressures work how um rapid fire grows with with um oxygen introduction um, that turned that stairwell into a chimney and it ended up killing those two firefighters. So the dynamics of understanding how fires are going to behave are super important to us. 
Uh, science. Oxygen, fuel, and heat. Heat, fuel, and oxygen. Um, I love the fire triangle. I think it's a great teaching aid. I think it's a great memory aid. I think it plays into all of our tactics amazingly. Yes, I know there is a fourth element. I know it's the tetrahedron now. I understand that there's the, um, you know, uh, continuous chemical reaction. Um, I, I get it. I'll be honest. I don't like it. I love the fire triangle. It makes our life easier, right? In the streets, we're not going to stand in the street and go, how are we going to stop this, this continuous chemical reaction, right? We're not doing that. That's, that's hazmat stuff. We're going to show up in the street. We're going to see that house on fire. And we're going to go, I need to take the heat out of that. Or, hey, we, I need to shut that door, kill that oxygen. Um, I think it's a much, much better aid. So, um, three sides. If we remove a side, fire goes out, right? Um, California, we have a lot of wildland fires. Seems like we just have nonstop wildland fires. In a wildland fire, we can't remove oxygen, and it's really hard to get rid of the heat. So we're going to take fuel, right? I'm sure you all have seen pictures of California where we just bulldoze a highway into the side of the mountain. We just get rid of the fuel. Fire will burn up to it, and it's done. Um, heat, we'll get into it more. Heat is going to be in a structure fire, you know, residential, commercial. Heat's going to be our number one uh, manipulator. That's what we're going to play with the most, especially with water and how we do things. Um, that's most likely the, the leg we're going to uh, get rid of. Oxygen, we're going to talk a little bit about oxygen and how we can manipulate that as well, um, but it's very hard to hard to do, right? All right, let's go over some uh, basic stuff. So some uh, fuels. Um, let's go over some pyrolysis. Again, this is probably basic for you guys. It's probably introduction pyrolysis, right? It's, you know, that um, chemical decomposition of, of our product, right? Something heats up. It chemically degrades, it lets off vapors, and it's the vapors that actually burn, right? Um, our goal of fire suppression should be stopping pyrolysis. It shouldn't be just stopping the continuous chemical reaction that is fire. It should be stopping pyrolysis. That's our end goal, right? Because if we can stop pyrolysis, we're stopping those um, flammable gases from coming out. Get rid of flammable gases, fire goes out, our day's a lot better. <clears throat> so um heat release rate that's what hrr stands for right hrr heat release rate um versus temperature those are two kind of two different things um if i have a candle um i'm gonna make up numbers just so that my brain at 5 a.m can understand it if i have a candle i'm getting one candle watt of power and the temperature of that candle is 800 degrees. If I take 20 candles and I lump them together, now I'm getting 20 candle watt of heat release rate, but the temperature is still only 800 degrees. But that energy is a lot more. I'm getting a lot more energy out of it, even though the temperature is the same. That's the difference between heat release rate and temperature. The temperature might be the same, but the amount of heat I'm getting within a specific amount of time is going to be increased. So why is that important? Heat release rate is what determines flashover, is what determines um, our flow path, is what determines the expansion of our gases. Temperature is just hot, right? Temperature is what's going to kill our victims. Temperature is what's going to melt our equipment. But that heat release rate, how much of that energy we're taking, is going to determine uh, what that fire is doing and what we're going to do to, to, to combat it. With that, different fuels have different heat release rates. You don't need to you don't need to memorize any of this stuff. This there's no test. Just have that basic understanding that wood has a heat release rate of again. I'll just make up make up some some numbers because again the numbers aren't necessarily important. It's the, the idea. Wood has a heat release rate of two. Plastics have a heat release rate of four. Propane and our flammable gases have a heat release rate of six or eight. So different products have different heat release rates, which is going to impact us a lot more. Um, one of my favorite things is to, to yell, wet fuels don't burn. Uh, when I teach our live fire training stuff, that's one of our big topics. Wet fuels don't burn. 
the fuel has to dry out before it starts its chemical decomposition. So dry fuels pyrolysize. Wet fuels don't pyrolysize. Wet fuels don't burn. Very important. Are there any questions so far, guys? Let, let me know. Let's see if I can put the chat up. I don't know how to put the chat up. Uh, I can't see the chat. Please speak up. Ask questions. You're 100% free to interrupt me. I, I'm okay with that. If I'm speaking too fast, I say something that doesn't make sense. Um, I have a tendency to speak so fast that my words jumble up. Interrupt me. Ask questions. Ask me to clarify. This is this is this is your guys' session. I'm here for you. So please feel I'm, free. To I'm watching the chat for you, Jeffrey. I'll watch that and have, don't have any questions yet. So awesome, awesome. <clears throat> All right, heat again. I talked about heat's going to be our number one manipulator uh, when we're talking about structure fires. So let me move my little thing here. There we go. Ah, that's better. So heat determines a lot of things inside of a structure fire, how it spreads, how it interacts with the structure, how it makes us um, behave inside that structure or outside that structure. Um, the big thing is how it's going to spread, right? Um, I think we can all understand that uh, as a gas gets hot, that gas expands. But if we cool a gas, the gas contracts. All right, that, that's a huge concept that, that, um, is kind of pivotal to the, our fire suppression. Hot gases expand, cool gases contract. And it makes sense, right? If I blow up a balloon with my hot breath and I put it inside of a freezer or an ice box, and I come back a couple of minutes later, that balloon's deflated because all those air particles have sucked in. Why is that important? If we show up and fire or not even fire, but smoke is completely coming out of a door, floor to ceiling smoke's coming out. And if I put water inside that compartment, I cool it down. I'm going to see all those gases lift up off the floor. They're contracting and they're lifting. And because they're contracting, I'm getting clean air on the bottom. So if I can contract gases, I can control flow paths. If I can contract gases, I can create survivable space along the floor for victims and rescue crews. So, um, big concept. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, heat spread inside of a structure, right? Um, you know, I have my little fire right here. Heat's gonna initially, in that incipient early growth phase, it's, the heat's just kind of doing its thing with all of its friends right next to itself. Once we start getting a little bit deeper into growth, that heat is going to go up in what's called a convective column. It's going to hit whatever barrier is up there, right? Inside of a structure is the ceiling. Once it hits that, it's going to do mushrooming and it starts coming along the ceiling. All right. And it's called mushrooming. As it's running around the ceiling, once it hits the walls, then it starts coming down, right? That's when we start seeing that neutral plane, that smoke layer come down. All right. Once it comes down and up, it's going to start pressurizing that room. And then it starts spreading outside of that room. So um, heat, super cool. I, the physics behind it, again, I don't want to get too deep into it, but the big things in, in our mind is the fire is the heat. We'll go is the heat and pressure generator, but we can control that heat with water. Um, why I don't crawl? This might be different for, for, for you guys. And I don't want to tell you guys to do anything different. Um, in California, there is, um, we're suffering from a, uh, what I call an over safe, safe We're trying to be too safe and we're making it dangerous for ourselves. You know, we're, we're so safe. We're dangerous. Um, <clears throat> when I got into the fire service and I, I'm, I'm sure it's the same with you guys, um, I was, I was told, you have to crawl everywhere. If you're inside of a structure, you have to crawl. Crawl, 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 crawl. Well, I have, I have full PP and I have a mask on. And I'm crawling. I can't feel anything. I don't know where that heat layer is. And so what we're finding is as we're crawling in, we've lost total situational awareness of where those heat layers are. 
and we're crawling too far in, right? So now um, I teach, I teach in our, I teach engine operations in our company officers academy. I tell our company officers, don't crawl. Walk into the structure. Your your nozzle guy, your your, your nozzle man, and all your they're probably gonna have to crawl just so they can manipulate that hose line. But as the officer, I'm gonna walk in. I'm gonna stand up because I want to know where that heat is. If it's so hot inside of a of a structure fire where I can't stand up, we need water. If it's so hot that I go like this, we need water, right? I. Um, we'll go into kind of pushes and hit moves, but as I walk, and I go, ooh, that's hot. The fire gets one, ooh, that's hot. Because my second, ooh, that's hot, because now I'm cr crouching lower, I'm telling my, my nozzle, open up. Flow water everywhere. Let's cool this environment. Let's cool the structure. Let's wet some fuels until that heat gets better. And I can stand back up, and then we can go. Some of you may not have SCBAs. Some of you may not be fully encapsulated. So don't try this. Just know that if it's hot, we need to apply water. Oh, that's not what I want to do. Here we go. Um, oxygen. Uh, I'm running behind. I want, I'll move faster. Oxygen, again, uh, up, upper explosive event, lower explosive event. We need oxygen for things to burn, but this is a very specific window, right? There can be too much oxygen, not enough fuel. It can't, can't burn. There can be too much fuel, not enough oxygen. It can't burn. Very specific window. Why this matters to us, that's when we start getting, excuse me, our, our rollover, our ghosting. Um, we'll go into dynamics, our explosive transitional events. How do we control air? We control the compartment. Closing doors, closing windows, um, things like that. Um, so door control, uh, we'll talk about it now, just so I'm, I'm not doing it too late. Door control. Big fan of door control. I'm sure you guys have heard, you know, door control, door control, door control. We got to do door control. I think we taught it wrong in the fire service. If there's no water, control the door. Don't let oxygen inside that structure. Suffocate it out. Take that oxygen out, let it suffocate down. If I do have water, my door's open. My door's open so water can get in, people can get out, and air can get underneath, right? I, we talked earlier, our number one priority is life. If I close that door, that entire compartment is going to go to smoke. It's going to go to hot, and then it's going to suffocate. With my door open, I'm getting some air. No matter what, I'm getting a little bit of air in along that bottom. Once I have water going through that door, it never closes. Because I want air to come in. We got so scared of air coming in that we forgot that we have a hose line and water with us. If it gets hot, put water in there. People are afraid about it, it, it flashing on them or it rolling back on them. Just put water down range. We want air coming in as long as we have water. That air coming in, that's what's going to provide a clear airway for our victims, a searchable space for our rescue crews, and allow that influx of clean air once we start shrinking those gases. Okay, here's my street smarts type of thing, right? I'm like you guys, I'm a basic firefighter, right? I, I, I'm, I'm not too smart. Um, you know, how am I gonna keep this street smart, right? Fire is five things. Fire is heat, smoke, pressure, sound, and light, right? Um, light, well, let's go with sound. Do I care a lot about sound? Uh, let's go with light, sorry, I'm all over the place. Let's go with light. Do I care a lot about light? Not really. Light, I'm not, I'm not too excited about. It looks cool. It really grabs our attention, right? Because evolutionary, like we see that, we're like, ah, that's super cool. But in a structure fire, I really don't care too much about it. Um, and honestly, I'm sure you guys have been in structure fires. You may never even see the fire. The smoke is so thick. It's in that layer. We may not, not even see it. Sound. Um, I do care about sound. Um, I'm actually super interested in sound. Because sound is probably the way I'm going to find the fire. Because it's so dark and so smoky, even from the outside, I can hear that fire, right? And we've all heard fire, right? That crackling sound, you know, um, just like a campfire. You're going to hear that crackling. And it's loud. Um, I mean, it's not deafening loud. But if you control your breathing and open up your ears, we start dropping our heart rates and start getting some of our senses back. You're going to hear that fire. Um, 
I never thought about this until we had a um, a big commercial fire is a multiple multiple um, um, uh, auto shop fire. We went in there, couldn't see anything. Um, I was with a firefighter. I said, hey, don't move. Hold your breath. And we both held our breath and we heard it way over there. And that's how we ended up finding the fire. We moved, we stopped, we held our breath, we heard the crackling, we kept moving. So I do care about some pressure. Do I care about pressure? I care a lot about pressure. Pressure is how that fire is going to move, right? And it's how I'm going to move in. It's how the fire moves out. And pressure is just that expansion of gases. So if I can cool those gases, it's a negative pressure. We're moving towards the fire. If we're not, that fire is getting hotter. Our gases are expanding. It's moving out towards us, right? And pressure is always going to follow the path of least resistance. The fire wants to be outside. That's where the pressure it lights. And whatever way it has to take through that structure of that house to get there, it's going to take. Most often, more often than not, it's through us, right? Because we show up, we open up the door, that's the least path, and then we have to go through that, that um, little path. So smoke, care a lot about smoke. I'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Heat, care a lot about heat. Heat's the enemy, right? Heat is what we're after. I care a lot more about heat than I do light. Because heat is what's going to cause pyrolysis. Heat is what's going to cause tissue damage. Heat is what's going to cause um, destruction of my PPE. So if we can battle heat, I can battle all of those other things that the fire is. So let's talk about smoke real quick. Smoke's four things. Heat, fuel, gases, and solids. So solids, I'm not, it's more of a sciencey thing. Um, there are um, micro solids in smoke. That's actually what carries the heat. Um, and usually they're basic elements like um, calcium, sodium, things like that. They're just basic elements. But it's actually what um, holds the heat as the smoke comes out. Not super important unless you're nerdy science. Gases, I, gases I care about. Because gases is, is what's going to cause that ignition of the smoke away from the fire, right? And we've all seen the rollover. Um, we call it ghosting. I don't know what you guys call it where like, the smoke is on fire, but the, the, the main fire is way over there, but it, it's on fire way over here. There's a gap between. We call it ghosting just because, you know, it sounds cool. Um, or vent point ignition, VPI, where the smoke's coming out. The smoke that's coming out the door is on fire, but the smoke inside isn't on fire. The gas is what's doing that, right? The the um, the fuels are pyrolysing so quickly that all of the, the flammable vapors can't burn at once. Um, same thing with, with the fuel. Um, there are especially with our um, our plastics, there are unpyrolysized pieces of fuel in it and they'll continue pyrolysizing this. Again, heat, heat's the big one, right? If we can cool smoke, contract it and move it out of our way. We're doing on time, we're doing good. All right, dynamics, we're gonna move quick through this. Sure, we've all seen this, right? Basic fire growth curve, ignition, growth, fully developed decay. Um, this is what we call a fuel limited um, growth curve, meaning that it has all the oxygen it wants. Um, it has all the fuel it wants. You know, this is our like campfire. Ignition growth fully decay or fully develop into decay. When do we typically get there with the fire service? Typically in growth or, or fully developed, late growth, fully developed. So um, we're gonna talk about this curve here in a second. Understand with this curve, it don't place the whole structure in this curve, right? My room, my initial room that was on fire might be fully developed. The hallway leading to that room is probably in early growth. The living room may not even be in ignition, right? It's just full of smoke. So think of this more as like a, you know, like our hazmat, like our circular zones, then the structure is fully, is in growth, right? It just helps us tackle it, right? Fully developed, tons of water. Growth, we're just cooling gases, you know, um, wetting fuels. So um, this is a different growth curve, right? This is our more realistic growth curve for us when we show up to a structure fire, right? Ventilation limited, meaning um, the fire ignited and it filled the structure with smoke. And since there's smoke, it displaced the oxygen. And then it starts going through that initial decay right? Because the fuels, there's still a lot of fuels that can burn, but the oxygen isn't there. So what happens is fuels start to smolder. They're still pyrolysizing, but the, the vapors are coming off the pyrolysized fuel aren't 
igniting. There's no oxygen from them. So they start that initial decay. And then we show up, you know, like, yeah, we're doing it. We show up, we open up that door, and then it hits us. It's not typically a, a backdraft like the movies. Um, it's what we call a, a, a um, rapid fire growth. It just goes goes off to the races. It's not going to explode, but it goes off to the races. Um, not saying that it can explode, it can, but typically it's more of just a rapid acceleration. What's that mean for us? Like, why, why, why do I care about that? When we teach door entry procedures um, at my department, so when we teach, you get there, our first entry, um, you know, we, we teach, you show up, um, you know, you clear your run, you get your line down and you get that door open. When we open up that door, we teach our recruits to wait eight to 10 seconds before they rush in. Get that door open, wait eight to 10 seconds. What that's going to do is it's going to allow those gases to equalize. Air coming in, smoke coming out. We're going to create a neutral plane. And if those gases are so hot, they're ready for ignition. They have the fuel. They have the heat. They just need the oxygen that we just gave it. It's going to light off. I would rather be sitting on the front porch and it lighting off than underneath it when it lights off. Because if it lights off and I'm on the front porch, easy. Open up open up my nozzle, wet it down, we can make our attack. If I'm underneath it and it lights off, that's a different type of situation. Um, we shouldn't be there. Um, let me look at my notes real quick. We talked a lot about pressures. Uh, I don't want to hit pressures too hard, right? Just um, the smoke coming out, that's our overpressure. It's it's a positive, so it's pushing out. The air coming in underneath is a negative pressure, so it's moving towards the fire. Um, the neutral plane is the separation between those two. This is basic stuff you know, for you guys. You guys already know, so I'll go a little bit faster. But um, that overpressure, the size of that overpressure, we can control with water. So if we cool it, we can suck it up a little bit. Um, think of the fire itself as a pressure pump. If we put out the fire, pressure goes away. We can open up all the windows, let it all out. Uh, bad ventilation. So ventilation with water is good. Ventilation without water, bad. All right. Um, if we're going to ventilate, the hose line needs to be in place. We need to have water ready. Because if we ventilate without it, it's just going to let air in there. It's going to let that pressure out. And that fire is going to get what it's need, right? That, that fire is going to go into a good, good feeling, into homeostasis. And it's just going to pump all that stuff out. It's going to have all this oxygen we need. We need to have a hose line there to wet it, to put water down range and stop that, that um, pyrolysis. So vent with water, good. Vent without water, bad. Um, what we teach our company officers um, in our organization um, our truck companies, they ventilate, right? We're California. So we like to cut, uh, holes in roofs because that's just our culture. Um, well, they're the ones breaking windows, things like that. Our truck companies perform the ventilation. The hose line calls for it. So the truck company might get there, set everything up, right? Or however you guys run it, your crew, your ventilation crew gets, and they set everything up and they're ready and they're standing by they don't ventilate until the hose line says to ventilate, right? That officer or senior guy on the hose line calls out whatever it is, whatever um, communication technique you guys use, whether that you come out vent and run back in if you have radios, you know, if that's tugging on the hose line, um, what, whatever you guys use for, for communication, the hose line should be calling it, not the outside people because the outside people don't know where the hose line is and, and, and if they're ready for water. All right, strategy and tactics. Um, Recio, I'm sure you guys have heard of Recio. Fire suppression goes into all these, right? Rescue. If we put the fire out, it just becomes a giant game of hide and go seek. Um, exposures. If we put the fire out, there's nothing, you know, um, pushing on those exposures. There's two. There's two types of exposures: external and internal, right? External is fires coming out the window, it's pushing on the the structure next to it. Internal is like um, I'm exposing onto the, the story above or the story below, right? I talked about stairways, how important they are to protect them with, with hose lines. Um, we had a, um, 
a structure fire inside of what we call a Victorian house, which is just a two story wood, um, wood frame house. Um, we had a solid crew, went into the first story, cleared the first story and protected that, that stairway for me and my crew to come in, access the stairs and go come up. They were protecting our our route out, our, our emergency egress. So um, that's an internal exposure. Confinement, confinement is just you're, you're, you're closing in on it, right? Uh, we'll go over that in a little bit. Extinguish it easy, overall easy. Ventilation, um, that's for truck guys. You know, that's that's for people who break windows and break roofs. And salvage, super important, super important. So slicers. Um, have any of you heard of slicers? I don't know if this has gotten all the way over to you guys yet. It's kind of newish to us. Um, and I think I think it's being taught poorly. Anyone has anyone heard of slicers? That's okay. Um, it's an acronym. You know, it's the fire service. We love our acronyms, right? Um, slicers is not RECIO. RECIO is priorities, right? That's our priority list. Slicers is our mnemonic for I'm the first arriving company and it's 4 a.m. in the morning and my brain's not working. I don't know what to do. So um, real easy, right? We're gonna size up our fire. We're gonna locate the fire. We're gonna identify our flow paths and our ventilation. We're gonna cool from a safe location and we're gonna extinguish the fire, all right? The RS, the rescue and the salvage occur as opportunities of um, like tactical opportunities, all right? Um, let's go over real quick. When we show up, we gotta size it up, right? Um, I think in the next slide I have it, yeah. Whatever acronym you use, you size it up. However your brain works, size it up. You know, we want to know key things, but we got to figure out what's going on. Locate the fire. This is typically initially done from the outside, right? There's a ton of smoke, fast moving smoke from the, the back corner. And on the front corner, the opposite corner, there's lazy, cold smoke. Well, then the fire's over there, right? Use the cues that we're seeing as... Oh, the fire is somewhere in this region, right? We just want a general direction and, and like a story, right? Second story is pumping out smoke. First story, is not, there's nothing coming out. Third story, there's nothing coming out. It's on the second story, right? <clears throat> Initially, we're just trying to find a general location to start the attack. Um, identify, control, ventilation, and flow paths. Again, we talked about that with door control, with pressures, how it's going to hit us. Um, when 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 flow paths first came out, um, people again. I think we taught it wrong in the fire service. People were very afraid of flow paths. Like, oh my gosh, you're in the flow path, you're gonna die. No, you're not. Relax. Is it dangerous? Yes. Can we control a flow path? Yes, a hundred percent. Flow paths. Not to get too sciencey. The pressure is really minimal. It's like one to three psi. Um, and the the how fast it is isn't. The, the mass of it isn't that much. It's moving throughout the structure. It is hot. It is going to catch fire if you do nothing for it. It is dangerous. But if I have a hose line, my hose line will always beat a flow path. The pressure from a hose line, you're talking 60 to 80 PSI, even though the, the nozzle might be 100. And the mass is much greater. So as long as I have water with me, I need to be respect the flow path, but I don't need to be afraid of it because I can beat it. Um, cool from a safe location. We're going to get into streams, but if I open up the nozzle and I get steam burned, I'm, I'm way too far. You need to cheat, right? I should be able to open up that nozzle from a safe, comfortable location and use the reach and penetration of my stream to cool the gases way over there and not take that hit from where, where I am. And they extinguish the fire. All right, here's my thoughts. Um, Again, I love Resio. I use Resio on every fire. I'll, I like slicers. We teach it in the, the Officers Academy. Um, it's a great, like, like uh, vapor lock. You know, kind of like, uh, I don't know what to do. Slicers. Just do slicers. You're going to be good. Um, I have my own size up acronym. There's tons out there. You know, um, you know, Cole as well. And um, man, all, there's, there's tons of them out there. There were, it was a lot for me. My brain can't do that many. 
So I made my own. Um, as an engine company officer, I use below. What's my building? What's the extent of the fire? Where's the location of the fire? Occupants, where are they? Um, or is there any and where are they? And then water needs. Do I need a, a small hose line? Do I need a big hose line? What type of water supply do I need? Um, is there sprinklers in the building? Things like that. And when I'm doing my size up, I'm doing it for right now, but I'm also doing it for what's it going to be in five minutes, right? Because it's going to take me at least two minutes to get a line through that front door. So where's it going to be in three minutes, right? Where's this thing moving? What's going to be impacted? So um, three things that must happen on every fire. Water goes in, smoke comes out, people get found. Um, we make fire suppression and firefighting complicated. It should not be complicated. Real basic. It's 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 caveman level stuff. Things are hot. We put water on them to make it go away. That's that's firefighting, right? Water goes in, smoke comes out, people get found. We do those three things on every fire. You're doing a pretty pretty darn good job. All right. A lot of background information. Let's get into the down and dirty. Um, we talked a lot about it. Wet fuels don't burn. We don't need to get into a lot of that. Um, streams. Let's talk about streams. Do I have in here? All right, we're going to do it right now. Streams. Um, two, two kind of uh, camps with, with streams. Straight or sol solid streams, fog streams. Um, I am a straight or solid stream type of guy. I'm not a fog type of guy. And here's why. Um, fog, go ahead. This is common. Should we, like you said, should we give any that to stands? Yes. Let him I stick to his lane. Him. We've got no problem with him. Let him just stick to his well, lane. Well. Mm. Okay, my brother, I didn't know. Neither did we. I, I'm I'm really sorry. I couldn't hear you. I have tinnitus real bad. I've been blown up a couple of times. Um, can you put that into the chat? Um, if you could throw that question into to the little chat thing, um, I think Chief can can read it off, and and I can actually read it again. I have really bad tinnitus. Um, my twenties were spent in Afghanistan, so it's hard for me to hear things. Um, while you're doing that, I'm just going to keep, keep going, and then we can check the chat. Um, <clears throat> so streams, fog, straight stream. So fog, um, what the science is telling us, uh, fog, amazing for controlling heat. Really good for controlling heat. Um, to the point where science, you know, science heat, it's like 98% efficient. I Meaning the water we put out absorbs heat, goes away. That's great. The problem with steam or with uh, fog the penetration is three meters. It only goes three meters. I don't know about you guys, but the structure fires I go on are much deeper than three meters. So three meters, great. We've controlled heat. It's been absorbed. It goes away. But the rest of the structure is still on fire and still taking a lot of heat. And with that flow path, I'll cool those three meters. But because there's that flow path, um, that bubble I just created for myself is gone within just a few seconds because it's being replaced by the heat and the smoke that's coming in. So um, I, I'm not a big fan of, of fog. It just doesn't do it for me. I don't, it's not wetting my fuels either. It's just controlling the environment. I want wet fuels. I want soggy fuels. I want a, a soaking environment. Like I want that water. Uh, solid, solid and um, straight streams, right? A little bit different. Like we talked before, if I open up my nozzle and I take steam, I'm in the wrong location. I should have opened up my nozzle back there. I'm getting inside that fire. And like I said, for me, you know, I'm fully encapsulated in my mask. My second, ooh, that's hot. We're opening up that line and we're going to coat everything. I'm going to do a, my nozzle is going to do a circular pattern from where we are. He's going to start straight up circle and he's going to make circles all the way down that structure as far as he can. And he's going to wet everything. Yeah, he's flowing for about 10 plus seconds and is putting water in there. That's gonna cool my environment. That's gonna wet my fuels. Um, it's gonna start cooling my structure and it's doing it way over there. 
So all that con steam conversion, everything is happening way over there. There's also the add benefit actually brings in air, which is, is something. Um, once he's done, we've converted. Environment's good. My fuels from me to as far as we could have hit are wet. So if this fire burps back at us, it tries to come back at us, that fire has to roll across all those wet surfaces. As it does that, all, that, all those wet surfaces are sucking in the heat. And that rollover, that pushback, is just going to be absorbed right into our wet fuels, and it's not going to hit us. We're putting a blockade between us and the fire. And then we can advance and keep going, going to such. So big fan of using my reach and my penetration and my stream to hit someone over there, right? We use the analogy, um, we're Americans, we, we, we love our guns, right? Um, so we use the analogy in the fire academy, like, I would rather, um, you know, use my rifle to shoot the target 300 yards that way than to try to stab it with a knife, right? If I have a bad guy, if I try to stab a bad guy with a knife, uh, he's going to punch me. He's going he's gonna to stab me right back. But if there's a bad guy way over there, I can shoot him with a rifle. He's never, he'll never have a chance with me. So that's how we kind of idealize it. Uh, see, reach a stream, boom. He can, he can control that room in about 10 to 15 seconds from the outside. Um, <clears throat> reach and penetration, again, great. If you don't have PPE or SCBA or good hose lines that you can trust, hit it with a straight stream or solid stream from the outside. Use those windows and just leapfrog windows down that structure, just like we would on the inside. You're just going to do it from the outside, hitting those windows as you get move closer and closer to that um, that seat of the fire. It's just start controlling things, right? That's what we do. I mean, it's not like the movies here where we're, we're inside, we're taking the heat, and we're fighting the dragon. And, no, if we can hit it from a window, we're going to do that. We're going to cheat. If you're not cheating, you're not trying very hard. So if I can find that seat from the outside and hit with the hose line, we're doing that every single time. And then we can go inside. Once that, that air cools, we're getting some good inlet where we can stay inside that oxygen, stay inside the cool air, and then we can do stuff on the inside. But if we can hit it from the window every time. Um, we talked about that. Um, direct versus indirect. I don't want to get too too nerdy on this, uh, and we're getting close to, to, to the time. Um, indirect is just you're fighting the products of the fire. You're not actually fighting the fire. So you're fighting the, well, we talked about all that smoke, right? The heat, the pressure, the gases, um, the solids, all those things. You're fighting the rollover, the ghosting, the flow path, putting fire out, which is direct, right? Direct is you go in there, whatever's pyrolysizing, you're putting out. That's easy. We, we, we do that when we do campfires. Getting there is the hard part. So indirect, we're fighting our way to the fire. Direct, you're, you're bringing your nozzle down and you're actually stopping that pyrolysis. Okay. So <clears throat> when we teach our initial academy with, with our recruits, uh, we make things super simple. When we're doing fire suppression, we have three targets, our gases, our fuels, and our structure. So when I say we open up our, our nozzle, we open up our nozzle straight stream, we do a circular pattern or a U pattern from near to far, right? Full bail, fully open, U or circle, near to far. And we're hitting three targets. We're hitting our gases, right? Because we want to cool our gases so we get lift, right? And to cool our environment, make our, our uh, environment um, survivable. We're going to wet our fuels. Wet fuels don't burn. And we're going to cool our structure, which um, we're not going to get too much into it. But if we cool our structure, our structure will actually absorb heat and it won't auto um, auto reflect that heat back, back inside, which causes flashover and all that stuff. But three targets, gases, fuels, structure. We're going to do that by opening our nozzle all the way. U or circle pattern from near to far, eight to 10 seconds. Um, three signs of a good result. So if we're doing it, we're looking for results, right? Three of the signs we're looking for is a reduction in heat. We feel less heat. We don't feel as hot, which, um, initially those first couple seconds, your heat's going to increase because it's turning from dry heat to wet heat, which, um, wet heat transfers energy four times greater than dry heat, which don't, it just, it, it it's the same temperature, but because it's, um, Moist now, you're gonna feel it more. But then that should go away. You feel it for a couple of seconds and then it should go away. We're looking for that reduction of heat. 
We're looking for an increase in visibility or a lifting of that neutral plane. Uh, we may not see a, a, uh, a lift of the neutral plane. What you'll see is in this picture here, it's more clear, right? This is him after he um, put water down range. It's a little bit clearer. I can see further. Um, and water return. Water return is if I put 100 gallons up into the environment, I'm getting 80, 90 gallons raining back down. We want that water to rain back down. Um, that, that's a sign of a good result. So three targets, gas fuel structures, three signs of, of uh, good results, reduction of heat, increase in visibility, return of water. All right, we went in there, we did it. We, we hit it from the outside, we leapfrog windows, or if we could, you know, we stayed low, we stayed in that, that um, under pressure inside that good air, you know, and we, we hit it and it's knocked down. We got knocked down, right? What we teach the academy is three things, Immediately, immediately post knockdown. So three things uh, post post knockdown. We're gonna vent. So we're gonna start opening up windows. We're we'll open up the ceiling. We're gonna vent. Uh, we're not gonna open up the ceiling. I'm sorry. We're gonna open up windows. We'll put a fan in the door, or we'll use the natural uh, wind, or just get stuff up and start blowing it out. We're gonna vent. The reason we're gonna vent is because we're looking for victims, right? We're gonna vent, get the smoke out. And then we're going to search, right? We need to do a quick primary search. If it hasn't been done so already, we need to search the entire structure because what we're going to do next is we're going to check for extensions, right? And when we check for extensions, we're going to start pulling things down, right? What can happen would actually happen um, to a, a department near where, where I work is um, they ventilated, but they didn't search. So when they pulled the ceiling down and all the stuff down, it covered up a victim and that victim wasn't found until two days later and it was found by, by the family. Um, and we don't wanna do that. So make sure we're clear victims, then we can start bringing stuff down. Start checking for all those hidden fires. All right, water supply. Let's see if I can get out of, out of here. Stop, stop sharing. Uh, see. There we go, all right. Um, and this PowerPoint, I think, is going to be sent to you guys, too. So um, go for it. This is the, the time where I want to inter interact with you guys. I want to hear what, what you guys have to say. Um, the, the chat's great. Let me just look at the chat real quick. We just had a bunch of people introducing themselves. Oh, great. Okay, awesome. Yeah, kind of from all over the place. Uh Mombasa, Nairobi, Saudi Arabia, Malawi. All oh, nice. Here. Pretty pretty cool. Awesome. Awesome. Again, I'm super honored that you guys are here. This is, I'm, I'm very touched, you know, definitely hits, hits the feels. So I want to hear from you guys and what your situations are. We have to have a water supply before we have fire suppression. Um, we need to have water and good hose lines to go in fight fire. What type of water supply do you guys have as far as um, full the tanks, like mobile tanks you can put water in, um, mobile water supply where we have trucks bring us water, those types of things. I mean, is that, is that going to be a challenge for you guys? What about Dean from Saudi Arabia? What do you guys have in Saudi Arabia there for water? Oh, I saw you wave, but you're pretty far away from the mute button. How about uh, someone just throw something into, into the chat box? You don't necessarily have to talk, but just throw something into the chat box of like, Hey, we don't have good water supply, or hey, we have we use folded tanks or mobile tanks. Uh, we use just what we got on the engine, things like that. A static source, awesome. Mm -hmm. How do we prevent water damage during suppression? Uh, when you are fighting fire and the water returns is in. Okay, great question. Great question from Kennedy. Um, how do we prevent water damage? Uh, he has two questions. How do we prevent water damage? Water damage occurs in the overhaul phase. 
right? Initial fire suppression statistically is using less than 100 gallons. Um, on like 95, 98% of the fires, we're using very little water um, to the point where my organization changed the priority of getting the hydrant. We've moved it to the third engine from, from the second engine. Um, typically, I mean, man, except for big commercial fires, most of the fires I go on, I catch with my tank. Um, so I'm not too worried about water damage until the overhaul phase. Cause then you get like, oh, there's a little ember right here. I'm going to open up the nozzle on to get that little ember. No, just scrape that ember off. Just put it in your glove, get rid of it. Um, that's where water damage occurs is an overhaul, not fire suppression, because during fire suppression, it's converted into steam and it goes away. So, and then he went on to ask, uh, when you're fighting fire and the water returns and it's hot, does that mean that the fire is still there? No. If the fire was still there, it would be steam. Hot water coming down, great thing. Um, it's just hot water because you're inside of a fire. If it was fire was still there, it'd be steam and it'd go away. So hot water return, good. Um, uh, so I saw static water sources, mobile water supply. Th those were great. Huge fan of them. Um, I live in a rural area. I live on a farm. Um, and so where I, I live, my organization, my fire department that serves me is all mobile water. It's all static water sources, um, water tenders, um, mobile water supply, and they're great at it. It is something that they drill on all the time. And it's something where I would recommend to you guys, if that's your water supply, is mobile water supply, full the tanks, um, static sources, that should be one of your number one training evolutions that you do. Because that water supply needs to be down patent. It needs to be solid so that you can do fire suppression. You can't do fire suppression until you have good water supply, until you can trust your water is going to be there, and then you can do good fire suppression. So if that's good, you guys got to figure out what your routine is, how you're going to do it, and train on it to where it's second nature. Um, does anyone have, and you can put in the comments, or I think there's like even a raise your hand button on this thing. Does anyone have problems where they just don't have water or good hose lines um, to conduct fire suppression? Um, one of the the uh, the jokes that we say um, in, in in my my organization. Um, probationaries, new people, they can only pump one line. And so the joke, that, you know, because of that, our culture, our joke is, well, I only need one line to put out a fire. If you have problems with equipment or water supply, get things together, pull things from everywhere and get one solid hose line. One solid hose line, one solid water supply, and you can do so much work with one good hose line and one good water supply. If you got that, you you could do almost anything you want. So, um, yeah, pull together. <laughs> ask neighboring agencies. You know, be be creative. Get that good water supply. So, and you uh, can be real. You can be real creative. I work in the oil field here in North Dakota, and they, we have water trucks all over the place to to operate the oil rigs, right? Um, when we have large wildland fires or whatever. Those those companies they'll bring us water. You know, I've I've used water out of cement trucks. Um, it doesn't just have to be from firefighters. You know, use construction companies to your advantage, um, and stuff like that. But I'm gonna wrap up here, um, quick, and then we can continue questions after. I want I want to stop the recording here. Um, first and foremost, thank you, Jeffrey. Uh, very informative. I've been on, been firefighting for 20 years now, and a lot of good refresher in there and some, some new stuff. So I, I definitely appreciate you spending time with us today. And I also failed to mention in the opening, for those of you who are here for 70% of the time, which is about 40 minutes, you'll get a certificate. Um, I think it's emailed to you. Um, but really great training. I just want to, as we leave, remember our words of encouragement about life of service, right? Um, like Jeffrey spending time to 
come out here and uh, teach as a volunteer. All of you, well, most of you guys on this call are not getting paid necessarily to be here. You're doing it because you want to improve yourself, improve your knowledge, which protects your lives and property in that community. So kudos to all of you. Thank you, Jeffrey. Next week, we're going to have Ed come in. And I I don't know what he's teaching, but knowing Ed, it's probably about water supply. So it's a good piggyback on this one. Uh, so next week on the same time. So I'm going to stop the recording and then we can have some open discussion.